We're about to see two compelling reasons why SDAs should care about the Apocrypha. And if you don't know what I mean by Apocrypha, no worries, we'll get to that shortly. Here's what to expect in this video. We'll start by answering, what is the Apocrypha? Now, it won't take long. I'm going to keep it super simple and basic. Then we'll look at quotes from early SDA pioneers, which demonstrate very clearly that they cared about and quoted from the Apocrypha. That's a compelling reason for SDAs to care about it. And evidently, God cared enough about the Apocrypha to give Ellen White visions about it. That's the second compelling reason why SDAs should care about the Apocrypha. Now, there's more that could be said for why SDA should care about the Apocrypha, but I'm keeping this to these two reasons for now. So, what is the Apocrypha? Now, there's no standard Apocrypha, but in general, when early SDAs used the term Apocrypha, they were talking about books in the Old Testament that are accepted by non-Protestant Christians, but usually not accepted by Protestants like these books here. These books used to be included in Bibles as a standard thing. It wasn't until the 1820s that the Apocrypha was no longer a standard part of the Bible, but people still had their Bibles, you know, the ones that had been printed prior to the 1820s, they still had those Bibles. It's not like the Bibles with the Apocrypha suddenly disappeared or went out of use. So it really should come as no surprise to learn that early SDAs were not only familiar with these books, but that these books were in many of their Bibles and that they cared about and quoted from the books called Apocrypha. Okay, so here's an example from Joseph Bates. Now, this is taken from a tract he wrote called The Opening Heavens. He wrote this in 1846. And if you look at the yellow highlighted area, there's some yellow and orange highlights there. He says, the prophet says, behold, the time shall come that these tokens, which I have told thee shall come to pass and the bride shall appear and she coming forth shall be seen that now is withdrawn from the earth. And then he references a book called Estrus. Then he says, this shows that paradise is not located in this planet. Now, Here's where it gets really interesting. He says, but perhaps you do not believe that Estrus is a true prophet. Well, then, will you believe St. Paul? And then he goes on. But the point here is that Joseph Bates not only was quoting from an apocryphal book, but he calls the writer of this apocryphal book the prophet. The prophet says, and then he quotes from Estrus, and then he realizes that not everyone accepts Estrus as a true prophet. So he says, you know, perhaps you don't believe that Estrus is a true prophet. Well, what about St. Paul? So then he quotes Paul to back up his statement about um, the bride being withdrawn from the earth, showing that paradise is not located in this planet, and quotes from Estrus. Okay, so our next pioneer that we will look at this is a very famous SDA pioneer, Hiram Edson. You know, he's the one who, the morning after the Great Disappointment, October 22, 1844, he was walking to go try to encourage the disappointed Adventist brethren and was given a vision while walking through the field or walking through a field. He was given a vision of what actually took place on that day, the Day of Atonement, October 22, 1844. And that's when their attention was drawn to the fact that the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days was the heavenly sanctuary, that there's a sanctuary in heaven, as opposed to the common view at that time, that the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300 days was the earth or the land of Palestine, some portion of the earth, but the common view was that it was the earth to some extent. Okay, so he's the one that had that vision. And notice in like the green and the yellow there, now I have some stuff in red type. It's because uh, he, in an addendum, he makes some corrections uh, to some of the, there were some typos in this printing. And it was listed as estrus, but it should have been second estrus. And there were some corrections there. But the point here is that 
he's referencing things in this extra issue of the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. This is September 1850. And he's listing all these Bible references. See that in the green there was says, see Isaiah 24 and other chapters. And then he includes second estrus. Well, it's just listed right there with Isaiah and Jeremiah as part of scripture. And then on the upper right corner, he lists uh, second estrus 9 verses 11 to 13. And he quotes it again. And He's using these things to show um, certain points that he's wanting to highlight and to use to, you know, bring certain truths to light. And he's not saying that there's any reason to disbelieve Second Estrus. He's just using Second Estrus the same way he used the other canonical scriptures. Okay, so that's another example of an early SDA who cared about and quoted from the Apocrypha. Next, we have J.N. Andrews. And if you've heard of Andrews University, that's this guy. He Andrews University was named after J.N. Andrews. It used to be called Battle Creek College. And um, anyway, there's, there's a picture of it from years ago down in the bottom there as well. But notice here, in the end of his book, History of the Sabbath and First Day of the Week, printed 1873. Toward the back, he has an index of scriptures. And look, we see there Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. We see Joel, Amos, Micah, Zephaniah, Malachi. And that's what we typically think of as the end of the Old Testament. Oh, and there we go. Just like we saw in the um, video there of the King James Bible, right after Malachi, we find Apocryphal books, Second Estras, Ecclesiasticus, First Maccabees, Second Maccabees, and then it just seamlessly goes right into the New Testament. The first book listed in the New Testament, the book of Matthew. Well, it's just part of the index of scriptures. There's no distinction even made. There's no mention of it being an apocryphal book at all. So J.N. Andrews clearly cared about and quoted from the Apocrypha. Now, the next example I will share, I couldn't find a photo for her. Her name is Sophronia Peckham, and I might be pronouncing that a little bit wrongly. Sophronia, Sophronia, I'm not sure, but she had a little write-up that was included in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, December 18, 1855, and it's a letter to the editor, so it's addressed to James White, and She's just saying here, you know, she was just sending her um, money for the issues of the review that she was expecting to receive. And she wanted to encourage also just a little testimonial, just a little word for Jesus. She says, I'm not ashamed to confess him and his truth before men. If I were, I could not hope to have my name confessed before the Father and his holy angels. So then she goes on and she's saying his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path to guide me in the way I should go that I walk not in the way of sinners. Truly, wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Then notice what she says. I have it highlighted in green. She says, for a full definition See Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 22 to 29. It looks like that's a, a 9 there. It's kind of hard to read. But then she says, see also chapter 6, verses 12 to 21. Well, Wisdom of Solomon is a book called Apocrypha. It's a book that's that used to be included in the Bible um, prior to the 1820s. So right there, you see that she's referring to um, the book Wisdom of Solomon for a full definition of all the stuff she's talking about, about wisdom and, and the word of God being a lamp to our feet, et cetera, et cetera. And happy is everyone that retaineth wisdom. And then she goes on and she refers to Proverbs 2, verses 7 and 8. So there's no distinction made here. And um, obviously, Sophronia Peckham cared about 
the Apocrypha. She knew enough about it to know that for a full definition of wisdom, go to this apocryphal book known as the Wisdom of Solomon. Okay, now it's not necessarily the case that this was like some set thing within the early SDA movement that apocryphal books were definitely products of inspiration. Now, as we've seen, um, Joseph Bates certainly thought that um, Estrus was a true prophet, and Hiram Edson was quoting from Estrus just like he was from Jeremiah, etc. And J.N. Andrews um, was listing apocryphal books right alongside the rest of the canonical books of the Old and New Testament with no distinction made. But here we see a reply to some correspondence. This is in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, August 5, 1858. And it's not signed by any one person. It's, well, I don't know exactly who wrote this, but since it's written to the correspondents who wrote in to the paper, to the editors, etc., it would have been written by somebody working on the paper, whether it was the editor, the resident editor who was Uriah Smith at that time, or if it was a corresponding editor, um, the corresponding editors for this issue of the review were J.N. Andrews, James White, J.H. Wagner, R.F. Cottrell, and Stephen Pierce. So it could have been any one of those people. I think it's less likely to have been someone on the publishing committee but let's just say if it could have included those, the publishing committee consisted of J.P. Kellogg, that's John Harvey Kellogg's father, J.P. Kellogg, Cyrenius Smith, and D.R. Palmer. So it was most likely one of the editors, either Uriah Smith, Jane Andrews, James White, J.H. Wagner, R.F. Cottrell, or Stephen Pierce. And this is a reply to one of the correspondents. The person's name is D.G. Needham. You see it in the green up there on the upper right. And the reply is very short. I will just read it. We'll get the full grasp of what they're saying. So D.G. Needham must have written in asking something about the Apocrypha. And they say, concerning the Apocrypha, we regard portions of it as containing much light and instruction. If we were asked to specify, we should mention Second Estrus, Wisdom of Solomon, and First Maccabees. Concerning the Wisdom of Solomon, Sears' history of the Bible thus speaks, and then it quotes from that, which says, Although the fathers of the church, and particularly Jerome, uniformly considered this book as apocryphal, yet they recommended the perusal of it in consideration of the excellence of its style. The Third Council of Carthage, held in the year 397, pronounced it to be a canonical book under the name of the Fourth Book of Solomon. And the famous Council of Trent confirmed this decision. That's, that's the end of the quote from Sears' History of the Bible. Then whoever wrote this reply to D.G. Needham says, concerning the first book of Maccabees, it also says, quote, the first book of Maccabees is a very valuable historical monument written with great accuracy and fidelity on which even more reliance may be placed than on the writings of Josephus, end quote. Then whoever wrote this reply to D.G. Needham says, the question of the inspiration of these books, the reasons that might be adduced in favor of such an opinion, and the objections that might lie against it, we have never made a subject of particular study and are not therefore prepared to discuss. So this is a very relevant quote from early SDA pioneers in relation to the Apocrypha. They definitely considered portions of it as containing much light, specifically Second Estrus, Wisdom of Solomon, and First Maccabees. They thought it contained much light and instruction. But notice, they were willing to just not say whether they thought 
definitely like as a people, as a body, because this is the SDA periodical. It's it's speaking for the SDAs as a group. Um, when a reply like this is made, and it's like we can't speak directly for or against the inspiration of these books because we haven't made it a subject of particular study. And that's the reason they wouldn't answer yes or no. They just needed to look into it further. It needed to be a really pointed particular study held. But very clearly, many SDAs thought it was important and worth being familiar with. In fact, it would have been in very many of their Bibles just by fact of being included in the King James Version of the Bible prior to the 1820s. Okay, so the next pioneer and the last one that we'll look at before going to Ellen White is James White. Now, he is um, writing here. This is from A Word to the Little Flock, page two. This was published in 1847, and he references uh, apocryphal books just alongside all of the other um, canonical scriptures that he referenced as well throughout this publication in a word to the little flock. You see there, he's quoting Ezekiel, he's mentioning Ezekiel, then he mentions John, and then he mentions Estrus, uh, how they saw uh, in prophetic vision um, these things related to the plagues. Okay, so let's just read that part in the yellow. God has shown this day of wrath in prophetic vision to some of his servants by different symbols. So he's saying this is what people saw in prophetic vision. In other words, revelations by God to a prophet. He says Ezekiel saw it in the men with slaughter weapons, slain utterly old and young, Ezekiel 9 verses 5 and 6. John saw it in the seven last plagues, so that's John the Revelator, while Estrus saw it in the famine, pestilence, and the sword. The Bible contains many descriptions of this soon expected day of wrath. So no distinction made. He's just saying prophetic vision, Ezekiel saw it, John saw it, Estrus saw it. Okay, then further down in also highlighted in yellow, he says, see Joel and Jeremiah, Daniel, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and second Estrus. So James White clearly cared about and quoted from the Apocrypha. And then even years later, this is from the Review and Herald, March 9, 1869. There's a notice in the review, and he's explaining how um, people need to be, you know, responsible for uh, paying for the issues of the Review and Herald in advance, like they agreed to. And he's saying that when you don't pay for the papers that are being sent to you, it's crippling the work because it takes money to produce this content and you agree to it. So just do it already. <laughs> it's a really um, straightforward little write-up he has there. But Notice here, he says, great efforts are now being made by those who have charge of the publishing department to push the work forward. $10,000 are wanted to publish the new hymn book, the second edition of the History of the Sabbath, the several volumes of Spiritual Gifts, an edition of the Apocrypha, second edition of Second Advent Keepsake, and a half million of pages of our smaller works and tracts. Now, like I said, in the 1820s is when the Apocrypha was first kind of like taken out of the normal publications of the Bible. It used to be standard as part of the Bible. After the 1820s, ways were being found to make it less expensive to print Bibles. So what could they cut out? Well, they cut out the books called Apocrypha. And so not everyone's Bibles that were printed after that time, they didn't have the Apocrypha in it. So in order to have the Apocrypha, they had to be printed separately. And here we have James White calling for people to be consistent with 
at least paying for what they're getting when they're getting these weekly papers, the Review and Herald, um, pay for it in advance because we not only need to be able to pay for what we're printing week by week in the review, but we also need money to print these other works. And included right there is an edition of the Apocrypha. So clearly, James White cared about the Apocrypha. Now, not only did these pioneers care about the Apocrypha, but God gave Ellen White visions about the Apocrypha. And we're just going to briefly look at two visions of hers. One is this found in Manuscript 5 from 1849. And we'll just read it here, but take special note of the parts highlighted. It starts off giving a parenthetical note that she took up a large Bible and that it had the Apocrypha in it. So taking the large Bible containing the Apocrypha, here's what she is recorded as saying in her vision. And this is Ellen White's manuscript. This isn't something that was just found in some pioneer's shoebox or desk drawer or anything like that. This is one of Ellen White's manuscripts, something she had on hand. So it starts off with the parenthetical note, taking the large Bible containing the Apocrypha. So that's her. That's what she did. Now, this is what she was saying while in vision. Pure and undefiled, a part of it is consumed. So picture this. She's there with this large Bible. And noteworthy, that Bible contains the Apocrypha. So she's holding the Bible. She says, pure and undefiled, a part of it is consumed, holy holy, walk carefully, tempted. The word of God, take it, Marion Stoll. Find, you know, she didn't say Marion Stoll's name, but she, when she said, take it, she was speaking to Marion Stoll. So the word of God, take it, bind it long upon thine heart, pure and unadulterated. How lovely, how lovely, how lovely. My blood, my blood, my blood. Oh, the children of disobedience, reproved, reproved. Thy word, thy word, thy word. A part of it is burned unadulterated. A part of the hidden book, a part of it is burned. Parenthetical note, the Apocrypha. Now, the other common term for Apocrypha, well, it's really more accurate to say the Apocrypha can be translated to mean the hidden book. It means hidden, apocrypha. So she says, a part of the hidden book, a part of it is burned. Okay, so that is the first vision she has on record of God showing her things about the apocrypha. Now, here's another vision of hers. This vision was received by Ellen White on January 26, 1850. And this is found in Manuscript 4, 1850. And we'll just read it real quick. She says, I then saw the word of God pure and unadulterated, and that we must answer for the way we received the truth proclaimed from that word. I saw that it had been a hammer to break the flinty heart in pieces and a fire to consume the dross and tin, that the heart might be pure and holy. I saw that the Apocrypha was the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it. I saw that the Bible was the standard book that will judge us at the last day. Now, again, in 1849, the Bible that she was holding and taking and laying it upon people and doing things with it and gesturing with it, that Bible had the Apocrypha in it. And here, just a few months later, January, the very next year, she says that she was shown in vision that the Apocrypha was the hidden book and that the wise of these last days should understand it. So there you have it. Two compelling reasons why SDAs should care about the Apocrypha. Thank you for watching and be sure to check out our other videos. We cover a wide range of important topics and we're continually making new content. Now, in future videos on the Apocrypha, we'll expand our consideration of Ellen White's visions, 
or allusions to things that are only found in apocryphal books. We'll consider apocryphal books not included in the KJV Bible, and we'll consider implications of all this stuff and how it impacts the idea of having a Bible canon. Now, if you're interested in all of that, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications for our new uploads. 